Well, good morning. This is our fourth message in the series, Life Together, where we're looking at the question of what is church? What's it supposed to be? That's what we're investigating. Life together with Jesus Christ as our head, our source of life. In week one, we talked about church as a body where everyone is a part, everyone's needed, and without each and every one, we just don't work right. When, you're, when you are missing, something's not right. It actually deprives everyone else of what and who you are. In week two, we talked about church is not just a club or, or an organization. It's a family. We are, the church is the family of God, inheritors, heirs of God. And then last week in week three, there were more word pictures about what the church is. Citizens, a household, a building. Each of us are bricks. We're all lined up on the cornerstone who is Jesus Christ. And as we're coming into this week, week four of this series, this letter to the church at Ephesus and to us gets really practical. How should we relate to each other? We who are saved by God's grace through the work of Jesus Christ, how do we get along with each other as the body of Christ, as the household of faith, as citizens, as a church? I'll be honest. This life as a Christian is actually hard. It's, it's an ongoing. It, it just seems to never end. I mean, there are times for me when frustrations get the better of me, and it leaks out into being short, curt, even angry. And it can be stupid little things that I can't find where I left something that I know I left it in a spot where I wouldn't forget where it is, and, and it's gone. Or there's times when the urge to get short with someone because they're just not doing their part. When how would they even know what their part is? And they should just know. I shouldn't have to tell them. Or times when I feel like, <laughs> not that it's at all true, it just feels like people are against me because they don't see it my way. <laughs> been there? I have. You see, we live in a world with a constant barrage of what to think and what to do. The idea of love that lifts everyone, that's just pie in the sky. Everybody, everybody is just out for themselves or at least for their people. We live in an age of political correctness, of wokeness where being accepting means more than caring for or being with or even welcoming into your home and life somebody, where accepting means actually advocating for whatever someone thinks and feels. And if you don't agree with that person, with me, on any particular issue, especially political, then you are from the devil and you're evil. That's the world we live in. But here's the thing, if this Christianity, this following Jesus Christ is to mean anything, it has to mean something even now, how it changes, how we actually live our life, not just an insurance plan for when we die. Why? Well, because the scriptures truly talk about the change that comes with our new life in Christ that begins even now not to earn our trip to heaven, but because we're made new. We are made for life with God and with each other, even now, even today. So as we look at this passage from Ephesians, we're going to ask three questions. What was, what changed, and what's the result? So let me read the passage for you from Ephesians 4 verses 17 to 32. Now, this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their minds. 
They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. This is not what you learned from Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouth, but only what's useful for building up, as there is need, and so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with the seal for the day of redemption. These are the words of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable to you, my rock, my redeemer, my friend. So first, what was? What was life before Jesus? The passage says you shouldn't live your life like the Gentiles anymore. That is, followers of Christ should live differently from the pagans. Well, what does Paul say about those who are not followers of Christ, the pagans, the Gentiles? Well, that's back in verse 17. It says they are futile in their thinking. Their thinking was pointless. They're dark in reasoning. They live in ignorance and have closed and hardened hearts. Now, I don't know about you, but I often hear the charge actually going the opposite way, that Christians are not the rational ones, that that they hate science, that they believe in myths, that they're darkened in their understanding. Well, someday, sometime, if you're interested, we can get into that how belief in Christ and in the Bible is actually rational, actually supported by evidence. But let me give you one example of the darkness of reasoning. It's said oftentimes that there's just no absolutes. And yet that statement itself logically is an absolute. Dark in reasoning. And then we move on to verse 19. There is no sense of right and wrong. What actually drives their thinking is what feels good. Don't tell me what I want, what I feel is wrong. What you do only matters if what you want and do interferes with what I want. That's the ultimate morality. So the real ultimate motive, morality, the ultimate good is greed, what I want. I think Paul, the apostle, is onto something here. It's pretty insightful, and well, if I'm honest, it sometimes even reflects how my thinking gets off track. It's how I justify what I say and do. But Paul says in verses 20 and 21, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about it when you heard about Christ, when you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. See, that's that's the what was, how life worked before Christ. 
Let's turn to what changed. Verse 23, you were made new in the attitude of your minds. A transformed mind. To be able to think clearly, I would even say that we're called to be ruthlessly honest with ourselves. And that's not easy. Live on purpose. We can live driven by urges, like the pagans, like the Gentiles, urges to eat, urges to, dom that, to dominate, urges to gather up for myself. Because if I have it, you can't have it, and vice versa. Live by greed. But no, no, instead live by conscious choice, a new attitude in your minds. Then in verse 24, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Jesus actually said the very same thing to a Pharisee who came to him late at night. His name was Nicodemus. And Jesus told him that he must be born again, a whole new self. The Apostle Paul said, if anyone be in Christ, their new creation. So put on that new self. Put on, a better translation would actually be to clothe yourself with that new person in Christ. Clothe yourself with the new person, a conscious on purpose choice. But that phrase, clothe yourself, it's kind of hard in English because it sounds like it's a once-for-all event. You know, just put it on. But in Greek, it really comes out more like keep on being clothed, keep on putting it on, keep it zipped up, check it off, and always clothe yourself in Christ. Dallas Willard would say it this way, what would Jesus do if he were me? That's the question to ask. So what was pointless in thinking, no sense of right and wrong, what changed? You're a new person clothed in Christ. So what's the result? What's the effect in our lives? Well, first thing, there is or there should be no need to cover up, no need for masks and every reason to be honest and open with each other. See, verse 25 says it this way, put off falsehood, false faces, speak the truth in love. In the early days of Methodism, John Wesley insisted that every member be a part of a small group called a class or a band. If you were not an active member of one of these small groups, you were not a member of the church. And the first question of every meeting was, how is it with your soul? How's your walk with God this week? What are your gains? What are your struggles? What are your sins? Interestingly enough, it was in the 1880s in the United States that these small groups, these bands and classes, began to no longer be required for membership. And ever since then, church membership has been falling in Methodist churches. On the flip side, active growing churches all over our country, all over the world in fact, have active living growing small groups, home groups, life groups. And the purpose of these groups is not just information or common interest, but transformation to become like Jesus. In our global Methodist church, we've, we have a renewed call for small groups, for classes and bands. How is it with your soul? It was a time of confession of struggles in life and with sin, not, not to the priest, but to each other. That's what makes the body of Christ. You see, Paul says, get rid of falsehood. And falsehood is always a way to present yourself as something you are not. And after you've set aside falsehood, speak truth. Be real. In our words today, we would say, be authentic. 
it's not only in the body of Christ with other followers of Jesus that we become our true selves created and through Christ Jesus that's where we become our true selves in that kind of open authentic relationship and then Paul says in verse 26 be angry without sinning in other words settle it quickly anger is an opportunity for the devil and oh boy this is hard so let's look at what anger is anger is always a secondary emotion it's a result that comes after another feeling fear loss threat frustration Paul, in, in essence, says take care of those things with each other. Don't let them fester. Speak the truth in love. Get rid of lying. Uh, get rid of cover-up. And anger will take care of itself. And then if we read ahead to verse 29, we would also see Paul tell us to watch our language. Watch your language. Verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. In 32, be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Can you even imagine what might have been happening there at the church in Ephesus that Paul would be giving these kinds of instructions? Have you watched, observed, or seen groups of people in churches, God forbid, our church or your church, where these kinds of instructions are actually needed? Okay, there might have been backbiting or sniping. You know, you don't do your fair share. I didn't get what I deserved. Or maybe it was gossip getting passed and disguised as a prayer request. Whatever it might have been, it would have been driven by urges or by desires that are well, not godly. The question is, do any of these things jump out of the dark, out of the, I don't even know where that came from, places that are deep inside? Reasoning, thinking, is taking, oh, taken over by those kinds of urges, those kinds of feelings. And it leads to rationalization, why we're justified. It leads to kind of darkness in our thinking. You know, things like, you bought that thing you didn't need and broke your budget, gone into debt. You spoke that harsh word, you don't even really know where it came from, it just popped right out. And you staked a claim on something you didn't even really want or need, so you just got to have your way about it. Reasoning that take, is taken over by urges where we have to ask for forgiveness first of God and then to those who've been the victim of our random urges. The question then is, how do you, how do I, how do we go about clothing ourselves in the life of Christ with each other? Where we set aside false fronts, lying, where we can truly ask each other, how is it with your soul? Where we can deal with and talk about our struggles with sin and selfishness and self-protection. Where we can live together in confession and prayer. In our modern world, in thriving churches, these are accountability groups, classes, bands. Are you ready to be part of a group like that, to live in that kind of fellowship together? Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Settle differences quickly, so quickly that the sun doesn't even go down before they're settled. 
Jesus himself gave instructions about how to do that in, in Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus said, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and correct them when you're alone together. If they listen to you, then you've won over your brother and sister. But if they won't listen, take with you one or two others. Now, I know there's more to those instructions that goes on into detail. We, we're not going to touch on that right now. But the key is, don't let differences fester. Don't let the sun go down on the anger, the upset. Settle it quickly. If you have a situation that's festering or has festered, ask the Holy Spirit for direction and guidance. Seek out the help of a brother or sister in Christ or your pastor to help mend that broken relationship. Now, I know, someone may be thinking, Pastor Time, why do you even worry about this kind of stuff? <laughs> well, there's really two reasons. First, surely, these are instructions from a very wise man, the Apostle Paul, whose teaching has lasted the test of time. It's just good advice. In fact, it is life-giving advice. But second, if you're listening as an observer, because someone suggested it, you're curious. You've never actually given yourself over to Christ, to this thing called Christianity, this thing that is being in Christ. Then this may be all just good advice, and it is good advice. It works because it's built into our nature as human beings in the made in the image of God. You can take it or you can leave it. That's what advice is. But if this community of love is something you want to be a part of, this is also an invitation to give yourself to Christ wholly. Maybe for the very first time, or maybe is an act of rededication as you follow him. If you are in Christ, the follower of Christ, who, who gives new life, this message from Paul is life-giving. It is instruction about how we live, not to earn this life in Christ. It is the life we live today because we are sons and daughters of God to be transformed into his likeness. People dressed for life with God and life with each other. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us Jesus. Thank you that through him we are adopted into the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. And oh, we need your guidance, your power, and your strength to live the life that you called us to, to drop falsehood, to drop false faces and to live with each other, speaking the truth in love. Father, guard us, guard our lips, guard our hearts, that we would always be acting and speaking in gentleness and love in the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, hear this blessing from me. May the grace of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ our brother and Savior, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guard you this day and keep your minds and bodies safe in the arms of God's love. Amen.